Hello, everyone. I'm Dan Whedon. Welcome to another great episode of Unleashed the Podcast. I have a great guest today. Normally, we would be live streaming, but for whatever reason, I can't get on to Facebook to live stream. So we're recording this. You'll get to watch it later. Uh, my guest today is Libby Wagner. I'm going to introduce her in just a minute. But first of all, I want to let you know that uh, you're going to love all of our great guests and our episodes. You're not going to want to miss any episodes. That means you need to subscribe. Subscribe to Unleash the Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Google Podcast, iTunes, uh, uh, Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music. You'll find us there. Please do that and also like us on our Facebook page uh, so you can get all of the cool things that I post every day to, and stay uh, connected with all of the other members of that page. So enough of that nonsense. It's time to introduce one of my favorite people, my longtime friend and colleague, uh, partner in crime and in, in a bunch of different consulting things, Libby Wagner. How the heck are you? Dan, you know, I was just having a bit of a flashback of us introducing ourselves to people together and me noting that I was like the much wiser, older sister. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. I remember it was much older, not much wiser no, is what I, I think it was, sure. what, what it was like. You're not, you're misremembering that, I'm sure. Uh, well, let me tell, it, it, it's just funny because Libby Wagner, I had to actually say, how do you want me to introduce you? L listen, Libby is an expert in leadership, in culture. Uh, she works with some great organizations to help them to advance in those areas of leadership and culture. And we're going to talk about, I think it's her most recent article uh, or column that just came out and it's around leader leadership. Uh, in changing and weird times. So we're going to dive into that. But Libby, I got to tell you, you know what my favorite story of us together is? I, I'm afraid. What is it? <laughs> Do you remember when we went to the Starbucks building to see Patricia Fripp speak? <laughs> Patricia, Patricia Fripp, for those of you who don't know her, is, is probably the leading speech presenter guru in the world. She's fantastic. Uh, Libby and I both know Patricia. So when Patricia came up to Seattle to speak, and boy, I'm going to say this might be eight, nine, 10 years ago, At came least. up to speak for the National Speakers Association. Uh, Libby and I met there and I said, we're going to get in the front row. Do you remember that? <laughs> oh, I said, we're going right. to be in the front row. That's I want right. to be and so I think I said, follow me. I think I knocked over three people on the way to get to the front row. And then when it started, Patricia started and started speaking from the back because the lighting in the front was so terrible. And the one thing I took away from that is if you're speaking, always be in the light, right? Always Do you remember that? Light. I know we thought we were really cool, but instead what? we were like the bad kids in the back of the room as usual. And so. Patricia noted that I think yeah. for us. So yeah. Exactly. So listen, I, you know, I mentioned leadership and culture. I want to, I've, I've got this, I'm really uh, moving this over so I can look at it and, and read this. You have written for 12 years a column called The Culture Coach or, or Culture Coach. Mm -hmm. And I love the title of this one, Libby. It says, Managing People When Things Are Really Weird, Two Critical Tools. Libby, have things been kind of weird this year? It's been really weird and, and you know we're, we're even we're we're running out of words you know like if if anyone says unprecedented one more time we're all gonna like jump <laughs> off the roof right How about pivot? Says, what if we say normal what yeah, if we pivot. say pivot one more time i know it's 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 awful we like we need new language but so i'm sticking with weird I'm, I, and I'm you know the weird not. here's here's the other part is this weekend, uh, we're going to have to turn back the clock. So we get an extra hour of 2020. How wonderful <laughs> <laughs> it's that. So listen, this, this article, and I think it's important for people who are watching or listening to this, especially if they're in a leadership position, to, to talk about the managing of people. And I just wrote in my own column for the Kitsap Sun about managing people virtually and, and some of the importance of leadership around that. Mm -hmm. 
tell tell everybody what prompted you, what compelled you to write this column. Well, I think a couple of things actually. Um, you know, certainly my work changed in the last year. Um, although I I did some work virtually with my clients, you know, coaching or consulting or things like that. But I often got on a plane and, and I often got on a plane two or three or four times a month and flew to wherever I was working or speaking in the world. And so, um, you know, I was on the plane March 6th with my last plane ride. I was fly flying back from Dallas. I didn't have any idea that uh, we were at the, Seattle was at the epicenter at that time um, of the virus. And I didn't even really know what was going on because I was like on the road all the time. and. So within about a week, Dan, my calendar emptied out, <laughs> like empty, yeah. right? I, I mean, know the feeling. Yeah. And, and so, so that was like the beginning of weird. Um, but the other thing is, you know, for years, people would actually say to me, so, you know, can you do this program virtually? Can you do this? You know, and I would say, no, 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 we, ha we must be in person, you know, because like, I think I'm really good in person, you know, and so I think you, you want the whole deal. So you want me to be there with you. <laughs> you right? want the full Libby. Full thing. So um, anyway, um, I, but I started doing um, programs virtually redesigning some of the things and I realized some really wonderful things about being able to have, um, you know, a, a, this kind of expanded way of do, doing my work. But the other thing was, is that people before this, you know, they would say, well, how do I manage a virtual team? How, how do I get people to trust each other and perform well and stay connected? And, you know, sometimes they're not in the same time zones or countries or whatever. And so I had done some of this work before, but this was, shall we just use the worst word, unprecedented, yeah. right? Like it, like everyone was working from home if they were working. And um, so I feel I, I wrote the article because I wanted to actually give people some helpful ideas for like the strangeness of what was going on with, with not only our businesses, but our lives. So I'm gonna throw your words right back at you and ask okay. a question here. This, this comes, this is a, a paragraph, the last paragraph of the first part that leads into into the important, really important section says, uh, you wrote, there are two primary leader, leader communication skills that we need to adopt when we're dealing with any type of change. And these are essential because people, though they may have very different personalities and styles, will move through a series of well-defined stages in response to change. And you said that first zone of a change journey is the emotional zone. Can you expand on what the emotional zone is and how our listeners can benefit from that? Yeah, so um, so just a tiny little backstory. So I had got a client last year and they were gonna go through a massive change. Um, they were gonna go through a merger. And um, as we know, those of us who work with organizations, you know, 80% of mergers and acquisitions fail, not because they aren't great business ideas, but because they don't pay attention to the cultural implications. So I was hired to create this program and I called it Leading Through Times of Change. And we were getting ready for this big restructure and redesign and all of this kind of thing. And I was in Montreal in February and we were planning for it. And literally like three weeks later, they got a change they didn't plan on. And so part of that model though, is the, of the change journey is that there are these very particular psychological zones that we go through when we're cruising along thinking things are gonna pretty much be what they were yesterday. And then something happens. Now that something happens can be a new leader, a new market, uh, a new process. It could be anything like that. Um, and we're, we're pushed into change and that, and part of the first thing that happens is we think, wait a minute, I don't want this. I didn't pick this. This isn't what I, I thought was going to happen. And so we're thrown into that emotional zone. So you wrote here, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm reading as we're going along what I find interesting. You're using my own stuff on me now. Okay, go ahead. I'm going to use your own stuff. <laughs> it says in times of high stress change, and, and we know this has been high stress for everybody. I don't care if you're a solopreneur or the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, if you've been in business, this, this has thrown everybody for a loop. 
in, in times of high stress change, people can get stuck, which means their performance will not, will not only dip or decline, but they will be unable and you, and you italicized unable, meaning uh, we, we writers know this word's important, <laughs> unable to brainstorm, troubleshoot or problem solve, much less do anything remotely like being creative or innovative. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. So here's what happens, whether we, we want to identify ourselves as emotional beings or not, we are. And what happens is when we're, th when we're, when change is thrust upon us, something we weren't expecting, we get distracted by that and, and things come up. We're fearful. We might have anxiety. We might be sad. Uh, we might be excited, but most of us, when the unknown happens, um, excited doesn't kick in right away. And so what happens a lot of times in organizations is when a planned change is going to occur, and this is really important about what's been going on. So, you know, like this company that was planning for the restructure, like those leaders had known about it for months. They'd been thinking about it and working on it and planning it. And so when they go and they tell the people, okay, here's the change, they've already worked through their emotional state and their state about like, okay, how's this gonna work? And how are we gonna make this, you know, how is this gonna change things for me? They've been brainstorming. But that first person, they're back in zone one going, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't know about this. I don't know if I like this. And so a lot of times the mistake we make is we think like, get on, like, get on the bus, you know, like all those things about get on the bus, get on the train, get on the whatever. But what happens is if we don't acknowledge where someone is emotionally, then they they dig their heels in. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. So so what you're saying is you may have put everybody on the bus technically, right. but everybody's at a different stage of dealing with this because as you said, we're all different. But that first emotional you might have people who got thrown, they're in analysis paralysis or they're in fear paralysis, or mm -hmm. maybe they have already said, I'm moving through this. And because of that, what that creates is chaos or, or dysfunctionality. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, I think it can create chaos. What it does, what it definitely does is it creates a dip in performance because okay. if I'm, if I don't have specificity around what the new, what the new plan is or whatever, and I'm just learning about this, I'm making up all the scenarios in my mind and I'm not sure what's going to happen. So I'm not actually focusing on, you know, my to-do list or my ordinary tasks. I'm talking to my colleagues or talking to my family, or I'm like, I'm trying, or, or maybe if I don't talk to anyone, it's just an internal kind of, of um, stress. And so part of what happens is if you're a leader and you know, this is going to happen, you can prepare for it and you can respond to it and you can help people navigate through the zones. I mean, the first zone is the emotional zone. The second one is reflection and the third is commitment. And the commitment is like, we're on the bus and we're going and we're implementing. And so, so it's just really important. And what I found because of all the changes that happened at once, Dan, see, it wasn't just that our company had a restructure. It wasn't just that like, our kids were all of a sudden home and we were homeschooling right. them. It, it wasn't just like, oh, am I washing my groceries before I bring them in the door? Like, you know, like it was everything at once. Right, at, at once. Right? And it so I'll ask you this before we go to the one thing that really helps to normalize. Mm -hmm. One of the other things is, is that, yes, it happened all at once, like in March and April, but there has been a series of rinse and repeats. Right, right. And frankly, yeah. I don't know about you, but I feel like we're back in another rinse and repeat. The, the mm -hmm. numbers are spiking. We're in a, in a presidential uh, election that has been somewhat unprecedented itself. People are trying to vote. People are dealing with, with social issues. And now we're, we're getting into November and December and a holiday. And I think a lot of people at one point thought this would be in the rear view mirror, but it how, how do you deal, and, I, and maybe this will lead to that one thing, but how do you deal with this kind of rinse and repeat where it seems like if you're in an organization, you may have felt, I think I've got everybody feeling pretty good, but then this happens and I don't know. 
Does yeah. that does that question make sense? I don't know if I no, it does. It does, but... and I, I was reading this thing. I was trying to find it before we got on here, actually, and I'm going to have to go and look for it. But I I kind of I read an article written by a psychologist who said that you know when we have kind of emergency sorts of things, there's a part of us that has this kind of like surge resilience, like we have all this energy, right? And we and and people will say, well. I was fine. I rolled up my sleeves. We figured out how to work from home. We got people to, you know, like all of this stuff happened. But see, we've had to do it over and over and over again for the last, you know, six, nine, 10 months. And so people are exhausted. And so one, <clears throat> one of the things I would say for leaders right now is that even though it sounds, you know, like corny and fluffy and whatnot, like radical self-care is so important right now, whatever that is for you, whether it's taking a walk with the dog or, or, you know, turning off your technology by nine or whatever it is like, that's, that's one of the only things that can help us get renewed at all just as leaders. But in terms of how we can impact the people who are working with us, the two critical skills are listening actively and empathy. And, you know, they're not sexy. I mean, I'm sorry, no, they're not no. sexy at all but they are the most profound and the most important and in the end, the most efficient and practical. Because if you're in this emotional state, somebody on my team, and you're worried about your elderly um, relative whom you can't right. see, you know, you're like you're talking through the window or, um, or you, you know, someone in another state you love passes away and you can't go to the funeral right. or like all of these things, right? If you're in that kind of state, and I'm saying to you, hey, we've got to accelerate our performance. We've got to get, you know, like you're doing the, that, like you're not even hearing me. So I'm um, going to go, I, 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 and I, cause I want you to finish what you're going to say. And I, I'm sorry for interrupting you. You're, you should be used to it by now in our interactions, <laughs> but, but I think what you just hit on, it took a little bit of a turn and I want to focus on this because, and I'm just going to go out and step out on a limb a little bit here, Libby. I think what our society, our culture has lacked in a lot of places is empathy. Uh, and, and, oh my and, gosh, yes, you're not going out on a limb. You're being a truth teller. It's, it's you know, I, I, I wanna say this. I mean, I, I've thought about it so much. I've thought about it, you know, um, watching, you know, uh, activities unfold in Seattle, right. um, you know, um, helping to hold space and facilitate space for, you know, social justice and anti-racist conversations inside organizations. I mean, if we are unable to demonstrate empathy, and this is the key, you can have empathy for somebody. I, I can sit here and have empathy for you all day, but if I don't demonstrate it, you don't benefit from it and I don't benefit from it. And it's gotta be genuine. Right. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it doesn't it's, work if it's not genuine. Yeah, yeah. You can try to say, okay, I gotta, I gotta force myself to do this. It's right. gotta be genuine. And that's where a, a very human part of this uh, comes out. And, and I, I think we've seen, I'll just say this, and then I'm going to transition to, to the end, but uh, because I want to talk about self-care, I want you to talk a little bit about that at, to, to finish off. I've seen, we, we've all seen some lack of empathy, but I'm going to tell you, I've also seen, in some of the business associations that I've had, and I've seen an incredible empathy from people uh, to everything from, you know, all of a sudden I've, we're having a business meeting and, and kids come in or dogs bark and it's like, nobody cares anymore. Nobody it's cares. Like, you know what? Take care of what you have to take care of. Uh, we're humans first. And, and I think that as much as uh, the squeaky wheel of unempathy is out there, I think within organizations and, and the great leaders really do a tremendous job of, of showing that empathy. Well, I think that it's a essential human skill. Um, you know, Lynn, Lynn Trust, the British author wrote a really great book called Talk to the Hand. And it's actually about, you know, like the lack of empathy in the world. And um, I, I think that we're, we're, we have a chronic lack of empathy. And a, and a chronic lack of deep listening. And we, you know, we're, we're addicted to busyness and, and speed. And there are places for that. But if we're going so fast, we don't notice. We don't notice our fellows and we don't notice, you know, we don't notice each other. 
And so what has happened to us in the last nine months is we have been forced to slow down and forced to see each other as human. And of course, it, is, it has erupted all kinds of things in society, but also inside of our organizations and even in our lives. And people are you know, um, finding themselves in situations and in conversations that they couldn't have imagined. And um, so having those actual skills of active listening and empathy is critical. And I'll just say this one thing, you know, I, uh, I have quite a few uh, clients in healthcare and, um, you know, the first few months of, of, of dealing with COVID, my consulting and coaching with them felt very much to me like trauma counseling. And I'm not a trauma counselor, <laughs> but I'm really good at holding space for people. And I mean, it was so stressful. I mean, like all the unknowns and all the safety issues. And then, you know, okay, we have to lay people off because we can't, but now we need everybody to be here because we have this, like we're overrun with, you know, testing and things like that. And I had one CEO to see, say to me, oh my gosh, Libby, I can't believe it. Like my team has come together. Like I, like I couldn't have asked for anything better. I'm so surprised. I was like, why are you surprised? You've been working have exactly this kind of culture, exactly this kind of communication. You know, you took the time to get to know them, to build trust, to be clear, like you did that. And then the benefit of that is in the middle of an emergency and a crisis and everything's weird, they, they step up, they show up. And I think, I think that people who've been able to do that notice the difference. I, I think they do too. And I would say that for anybody listening, uh, now is the time to start that. If, if you haven't felt as an organization you've been doing, start now. So listen, as we as we go out, and I'm going to definitely have you back for another podcast. Uh, I, I could talk to you about a whole bunch of other things uh, regarding this, but I'm going, I want to end with this. If you have, if there's somebody out there listening and they, they, they reached out <laughs> through them somehow and said, hey, Libby, what is your top, self-care advice for a CEO, for an entrepreneur, for a business person who's dealing with all of these issues. If you had one piece of wisdom regarding self-care, what would it be? Other than chocolate? Uh, Just, okay. Well, first of all, <laughs> cho chocolate and wine are at the very, very top. Very top of the list. And, and okay. those are probably in my future after our call. But okay. other than chocolate and wine, what would be okay. your number right. one self? So other than chocolate and wine. Okay. So I'm going to say the number one thing is knowing what to say yes to and what to say no to. That's the number one thing. It, 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 you know, again, it doesn't sound very profound, but, the, but, but part of the reason that we can't manage our workloads and our stress and things like that is we say yes to too many things and we say no to ourselves. And um, so I, I really think that, um, that that's the number one thing for self-care is, is knowing what to say yes and what to say no to. Brilliant. It was brilliant. Libby. Somebody out there is going to say, I, I, I want to read more of Libby's work. I want to hear her speak. I want to talk to her. How do people reach you? I'm super easy to find. You just, you just look for <laughs> Libby, LibbyWagner.com. So you can, you can Google me. You can find me on, um, on uh, Facebook and Instagram and, and Twitter. And, uh, but LibbyWagner.com is the easiest place to find me. So well, Le Libby, thank you for having joined us today. You will be invited back. Everybody else. Listen, thank you for being and, and listening to us. Uh, Unleashthepodcast.com. Uh, be on this Facebook page, which uh, I think you're probably at some point going to look at. I was going to say, be on the Facebook group page uh, or go to your favorite location, your favorite podcast platform and subscribe. For right now, all of you, please be well and above all, be unleashed. Be unleashed.